Let's go live button. So let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internet before we go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to get to today, but before we can dive into it, we got to make sure the tubes are connected before we start rambling off at the mouth. And it looks like they're working, which is tremendous news, which means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it. Shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney at the r r Law Group, located in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona. And today, my friends, we are talking about outrage. Holy moly. The media and some Democrats seem like they are turning on Joe Biden, and it's happening very quickly. And we can, have been following this with Corrine Jean-Pierre in the press briefing room over at the White House. But today is unlike even anything else we've covered thus far. We're going to get into it. We've got three different topics, subtopics within the big topic here. We're going to listen to some Democrat consultants, guys like David Gergen. If you've been following politics for a period of time, you know this dude is all over the place. I think he worked with Hillary and Biden and Obama and everybody. And he says... Big trouble for Biden. So we're going to go through that. He's also joined by some other people on CNN and other places. They're saying, look, this is not good for the Democrats. It's going to be impossible to prosecute Trump now. And they're all kind of melting down. We've got Peter Ducey at the White House is going to give us a very interesting update on what he's hearing outside of the press briefing room. Before we turn our attention to Corrine Jean-Pierre, we've got a whopper couple clips from her and not couple, a handful of them. And we're going to go through them. Now, they are getting good. They're starting to ask what her role was in all of this because she's the press secretary. Presumably, she's talking to the president regularly. And they've known about this story at the White House for months. So where the heck was Corrine? Well, we're going to find out. The media really dove in on this one today. You can see they're asking, what did you know? When did you know it? Why shouldn't Americans be outraged? Is this overshadowing everything else you guys have done? Do you stand by your statement that Biden's lawyers did the right thing? Is Biden rummaging around his own files? This guy literally asked that. Like, what is he doing over there in the White House Oval Office? He went back to Delaware. What's he doing over there? We also heard from this woman saying, are you embarrassed? Are you? How do you live with yourself, Corrine? Honestly, because you came out and you kind of lied to us. And finally, when Corrine walks out of the door, the media lobs one at her on the way out and she's had a bad day today. So we'll go through that one. Then we've got reaction from the actual politicians. Here is Raskin, who's gonna finally opine on this topic. We'll check in with Ilhan Omar. We've got James Comer coming up and then Christy. Where the heck has he been? Now he's out talking about the Biden document. So we'll go through all of that, of course, in our first segment. Then we're gonna turn our attention to Davos and the World Economic Forum bunch of these weirdos are meeting together again and they're all you know it's gross i don't know what they're doing you know just you know, behind closed weird stuff going on over there but the world economic forum in davos is taking place right now we're going to go through the video of doom from klaus schwab dr evil you see right here it's a couple clips from him we'll re fresh our recollection about yuval harari who wrote those books called sapiens and other individual books. We're also going to check in with Klaus Schwab, the actual founder of the World Economic Forum, this fellow right here. He had an intro, about a five-minute intro. He walked out and he said, listen, my people. And he delivered a message. So we'll listen to that. We'll look at inside the building. We'll hear from him when he get, uh, took a question during a panel about the metaverse. We'll hear from Al Gore. We've got John Kerry saying, we're all very special here. I'm special. You're special. I think he said somebody touched him when he was younger or something like that. We'll get into it. We have questions about why Christopher Wray, the FBI director, who's supposed to be running the FBI, domestic intelligence agency, allegedly, in this United States. Why is he going over there for the World Economic Forum? <laughs> What a joke agency. All right, so we'll hear from the FBI. I don't know. He's over there. Evidently, he's on the invitation list. And then we'll check in with this fella who says that everybody should own nothing. Now, Rebel News is over there. They're doing an awesome job. And some law enforcement goons over there were sort of muscling up against them. And so we'll check in with all of that. So it's a fun little uh, 
mess over there that we'll get to today in the second segment. And as you can see, we have a lot to get to, my friends. And if you want to be a part of the show, come on over to our community over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We have an amazing crew over there just chatting away. We do member-only streams in the mornings, and we also connect with each other before and after the show. We have after parties and other things. And so check it out. We did a movie night and, you know, we're trying to have some fun there. So watchingthewatchers.locals.com or if you're a member on YouTube, you get a lot of the same stuff. But really, watchingthewatchers.locals is the place to be. We'll also check in with our sponsors later from forpatriots.com. Promo code Robert. Get your survival gear and uh, survival food. And also our friends over at Gold Co. Check out robertlikesgold.com so you can protect your retirement with gold and silver. And of course, our law firm. The r and Law Group, we are a criminal defense law firm located in Scottsdale, Arizona. We have a mission to help good people charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope. We offer free case evaluations. Thank you for referring them over to us. Uh, Mrs. Mom 2 in the house says, did I hear that, uh, that da- Schwab left Davos after Soros? Yeah, I saw something about that too, Mrs. Mom. I saw that on a tweet, but I don't, I don't know if that's true or if that's been corroborated. Uh, and I think that is, uh, yeah, cause he spoke today. We've got clips of him actually speaking. All right. And so now thank you very much for the super chat, Mrs. Mom. I appreciate that a lot. What's all RMF. What's up? Holy F. We got a lot of people in the house. It's good to see everybody. Let's jump right into it. The Biden document dilemma continues, not looking good. Democrats appear to be turning on the president. And it's not just some people in the Democratic Party. It's also the media. They're also turning on Corrine Jean-Pierre. We followed this a lot this week. And she's been having a tough couple of days. Today is probably the worst of it. People were asking her about her involvement. And they left a big meatball question hanging out there before she walked out of the room. So you can see we've got a lot to get to from Miss Kareen. We also are going to hear from the politicians, Raskin Comer, Ilhan Omar, and Chris Christie. But let's start by going to the consultants because they are starting to hit the panic button. You are familiar with David Gergen if you've been paying attention to politics in any way, shape, or form. He's been a big name in the Democratic Party for a long, long period of time. And Anderson Cooper had him on to talk about this. And they're really actually talking about this. You know, a lot of the time they kind of just, you know, kind of give this coverage, uh, you know, token coverage, and then they move on past it. But we're getting in a couple days here, and they're bringing on some of these big name consultants, the people who kind of hold sway in the party. And they're saying, this is a big problem. This is David Gergen, a Democrat consultant heavyweight who says the Biden administration may have really stepped in at this time. Start with you. How big a mess is this for the Biden administration? It's very, very big. Not legally, but politically, it's a very, very big deal. Uh, you know, this is a president who was marching upward. For the first time in his presidency, he's got his numbers up. People are feeling better about the economy. There are all sorts of reasons to believe that he could, that he can now present himself. Uh, the fears that people like me have about how old is he and can he govern well, those fears will be dissipated if he were able to stay on that track. Mm. But now along comes this. This, this this gigantic story, which was totally unexpected, and it's knocked that uh, knock for six. Yeah. The original plan was it unexpected? A lot of people are asking now whether Biden knew that he had some problematic documents. Maybe that's why he had his lawyers rummaging around in there. Maybe they were trying to clean this up, and something popped up that they had to turn back in. They couldn't get rid of these documents, and so oh, they had to notify somebody about these things. So maybe it was expected. Maybe that's why the lawyers were at the offices in the first place. But regardless, I think he's right about this. This is a major blow. Biden was just riding high off the midterms. There was supposed to be this red wave that the Republicans bumbled as usual. And then Biden was riding high. Now he has the feet cut out from under him. And David Gergen is saying, it's a big deal, man. Now, but I do think that they, um, that the the Biden people, they they may be making a big mistake, Anderson. I may be wrong about this. I think they've done a wonderful job uh, being cooperative with the government. They They have no choice. What else are they going to do? They were saying, but I don't think sitting there hunkering down now, they're just acting like it's not out there. Is a is a good strategy? They're they're just going to have they're going to get cream doing. There's also been the drip 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 of information. Some of that unpreventable because you know they didn't know a special counsel was coming, but. 
they did know when they had the president talk yes, they about did. the first batch of documents that were found. Right. They'd already known that there were other ba yes. documents found. You would think they might have just jumped, you know, that, announced that all at once. Exactly. That's why they could have put that I put that out there. And as, as matters now stand, that long delay in putting it out there is going to encourage people to believe, well, what are they hiding? Yeah. Exactly. What are they hiding? What are they covering up? Why did it take so long for them to give us any information about this stuff? And remember, when we went through the timeline, we have the Biden timeline here. Corrine Jean-Pierre gave us a press conference back on January 11th. And at that time, Corrine was not being fully honest with us in our humble opinion. Evidently, she got briefed on this. We'll hear from her today on January 9th. She says, I found out right after you guys did. We'll see. But she, according to, to what we had learned and pieced together from the DOJ, from White House counsel, from all the different parties involved in this, is that there were several batches of documents, at least the second batch dropped on December 20th, well before the CBS story broke on the 9th, well before Corrine Jean-Pierre had her press conference with us on the 11th. So that gave her at least, okay, let's say she did find out about all this stuff on January 9th. That means that either somebody was being dishonest to Corrine Jean-Pierre, okay, like, like Biden's team is like not telling her things or she's being kept out of the loop. She's not involved in any of this. They just give her a memo every morning. They say, here, this is all you need to know. Go out and tell this story. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're sort of not outside the circle of trust here. So we're going to get into all of this timeline stuff. But now the question is, why on January 11th, why didn't she come out and tell us? If, maybe she didn't know, honestly. Why didn't, if she didn't know, why didn't she know? She's the White House press secretary. What's Biden doing? Doesn't he have a sort of a duty, an obligation as the president to communicate about these types of things to other people in his administration? Who else is not being kept in the loop? So Gergen is saying this is a cover up, right? This is all of them hunkering down to use his term we would say a, a little bit more uh, with some spice to it it's a cover-up now he's not alone there are a lot of other people out there in the democratic party who say this is not good this fella is over on cnn and he's talking with whomever and they're having a conversation they're saying this is bad news you know this is a a group on a president that tout their experience and their competency. And so the, the thing that I was hearing is not just, you know, and their transparency. And, and their transparency. Right. And All so, you know, they, they are institutionalists. They play by the rules. And I think beyond um, whatever comes beyond having to deal with the special counsel, which are two words no White House ever wants to hear. Rough. You know, they also they might be confident that in the end, this won't really go anywhere. It'll be fine, but it's going to hang over them for a while. Um, and I think the damaging thing that people are worried about is the, to that perception, this takes paint, some pain off of uh, the Biden presidency, and it's because they're supposed to be the ones who know what they're doing. They're supposed to be the grown-ups, the competent ones. And this does not look like, you know, an example of great competence here in terms of the management no, of this, not knowing they were there. The White House kind of started to, to maybe blame, you know, blame this on, on aides and people who were responsible for moving the papers, making- Aides? They're blaming aides? Oh, is an intern. Oh, okay. Clear, implying that, look, the president didn't know about this. He wasn't the one involved in doing this. But this is not good, and they know yeah. it's not good. And he's... Under they know it's not good. It's a catastrophe. They're all melting down. They have no real good answer for this. And they keep sort of layering on bad things on top of bad things. Like, the first question is, why was his personal lawyer rummaging around looking through confidential documents? All right, finds the documents. Why'd they call the White House first? Why did they call the FBI? And why'd the White House take a couple days to actually, uh, well, actually, let's go to the timeline on that one because it's a great question. Remember this, there was a little bit of a lapse there. Evidently, on November 2nd, that's the day they actually found the documents. Biden's lawyer, we still don't know who showed up at Penn Biden Center and actually found it, one of these two people. And I actually think somebody told me it, was, it may be somebody named Dana, so I might have to fill this in. But Pat Moore was somebody who we think showed up there on November 2nd. They found the documents. As far as we know, neither one of these individuals is certified, you know, classified document specialist handler, right? They can't see this stuff. So they find the documents. Apparently their first call was over to the White House. Now it took a day or two until the Justice Department actually got it because that's when Merrick Garland came out and told us on November 4th, they, that's when he started his diatribe, his, his press release. And he told us that that's when they picked up the phone. So what happened on November 3rd? What was going on there on November 3rd? <laughs> uh, the White House, who are they working on? 
were they like on Google, like uh, wait, what to do with classified documents? <clears throat> How do we figure this one out? Don't know. Very interesting question. Then it goes over on November 4th. Then they start. All of that, of course, took place right before the election. FBI gets involved. We get lawyers appointed. Nobody knows anything about it until we get to January 9th. Then Corrine Jean-Pierre finds out with the rest of us. Wow. And she comes out and discusses it with us. So yeah, it does look pretty bad. They're all a little uh, panicked about it. And you can see CNN's even admitting this is not good. Now, their big, big win of 2022 was the raid on Donald Trump. I mean, they put all their eggs in that basket. It was going to be enough to carry them through the whole next two years of a very lame a Biden presidency. Nobody really wanted this guy, but they could live with it because they knew they were going to go take out Trump and they're very upset with Trump. <clears throat> so after Trump gets his house raided, they are on top of the world, man. They are living large. Life's good because yes, they have to live with Joe, but Trump's going to get indicted. Turns out all of that starts to unravel when Joe Biden did something that's even worse than Trump. We were talking about this on our members only stream this morning. I don't know that there's anything else that the Democrats could have done that would have been a bigger gift to Trump that would have deflated this issue better. Now, Aggie Martin on our community brought up a great point. And he said, well, what if Joe Biden resigns? He says, this confidential document saga is a really big problem. I resign and that should disqualify Trump too. If that happens, that might bring the power back into this thing. We'll see though. There's a lot of road ahead and we don't know if Joe Biden's going to voluntarily bow out or if he's going to go down fighting or what. But here on Meet the Press, Democrats are admitting this really deflates their efforts. Mark, what do you think this means for Trump? Uh, I think that it's impossible for the Biden administration to prosecute Trump at this point. I think it's I think what Americans are frustrated about is the continued double standard that they see at Department of Justice. And I don't see how they would continue forward. Do you think Garland at least attempted to, I mean, do you think he's doing his best to try to up, essentially push back at that narrative? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think the reality is that the, the. No. No, he didn't raid any of Biden's properties. That would have been pushing back against that narrative. It would have been the equal hand of justice. It's only fair. If Trump had documents, FBI needed to make sure they got them all. That was part of the argument. That's why they had to go into Melania's closet. They didn't trust him. Joe Biden has now had documents at three different places, two different residences, one at a Penn Biden Center, the other at a residence, one in the garage, one in a filing cabinet. That's not a skiff. It's not secure. So here... Merrick Garland can try to fake being fair, but he sent the FBI after one person, not the other. The facts here is that they discovered this in November. Why, why, why did they hold it? Why didn't anybody talk about it? Is it because, it was, is it because of the midterm elections they didn't want to interfere yes. with? And, and this was six years ago. This wasn't from his time as president, it was from his time as vice president of the United States. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like the Biden administration decided the 12 days of Christmas weren't enough for Republicans. They want to oh. keep it going as long as they can. Zinger, 12 days of Christmas. He's like, yes, perfect. Got that one worked in there. Love it. Nice job. Check it. He's like, honey, I got home. He's like, honey, guess what? I used the 12 days of Christmas line. She's like, you're kidding. How'd it go? They loved it. They're talking about it on YouTube too. All right. So I think he's right. It is a little bit of a gift for the Republicans and definitely a gift for Donald Trump. I mean, it takes the whole issue right off the uh, the playing field. So they're saying this is not looking good. We're going to check in with our friend Peter Ducey over at the White House because, you know, there's something interesting that happens. First of all, Corrine Jean-Pierre, for some reason, doesn't call on him, even though he's one of the best question askers in the entire press. Shout out to our friend Peter Ducey. And he's out there communicating to Corrine, trying to get answers for the American people like a good individual. And she doesn't call on him, which is very rude. So he's trying to get answers from her, but he also talks to a lot of other people there on the campus of the White House. 
And here's what he's reporting back over to Fox News. First, let's go to the White House where Peter Ducey is standing by. Hi, Peter. What's up, Peter? And Dana, just from a practical standpoint, the Secret Service can't <clears throat> keep records of or logs if they... We'll pretend like he's talking to us instead of Dana, all right? They aren't there. So we have a new way to look at this issue of asking for visitor logs. I found a photo on my phone this morning taken... April 2019, the day Biden announced his run. You can see there is a Secret Service guard shack on the right and uh -huh. some parking spots for police cars just short of the driveway gate, but no agents. They left shortly after he left the vice president's office. VPs don't get Secret Service protection for life. Oh. This is an area now that is very well populated with big SUVs and a police checkpoint. So yes, in this photo, there were- So you can bring your meth van right in here. So Hunter and his friends, they can just bring that van, you know, the one that says free candy on the side of it. Joe Biden knows that van very well. So they just roll it up and back it in. Free candy for all of the kids in the neighborhood. Documents beyond the gate somewhere, but no, visitors were not being screened for several years. Still, Republicans say they think there must be something the Secret Service did see and clear people who went in and out of the garage, in and out of the guest house, people who mowed the lawn. Uh, the reality is we will be able to reassemble in time, even without their cooperation, some semblance of how many, perhaps hundreds of people could have looked at those documents. Wow. Even the landscapers and shout out to our favorite leaf blower guy, wherever he is. We miss you on our morning walk and talks. But a lot of people going in that area, obviously. No security, no no secret service, none of that. And remember the meltdown, the catastrophe that Trump having his documents at some resort in Florida. He was he was so careless with these things. At least he had secret service down there. At least it was at Mar-a-Lago. I mean, you don't just waltz in there. You can't roll a meth van into Melania's closet, idiots. But at Joe's house, you can't. Meth man right, backs right in there. It's no problem. Joe Biden has his lampshade in the garage covering Hunter Biden's bong. So it's all very, very uh, uh, insecure, in fact. But we're not hearing the hysterical preening from everybody else in the media over that one. The lack of concern that Republicans have about Mar-a-Lago and records found there has the White House counsel saying House Republicans have no credibility. Their demands should be met with skepticism and they should face questions themselves about why they are politicizing this issue. You politicized it first, weirdos, and you were the people who made much ado about nothing. You made your whole basically political operation about this, weaponized the DOJ, sent in the FBI, and your guy made a much bigger boo-boo older records from when he was vice president at multiple locations one of them in his garage and admitting they actually do not care about the underlying classified material top democrats say they don't know what is going to happen nobody cares about the materials i mean first of all they told us it was nuclear codes then it wasn't then we think they're love letters from kim jong-un or something like that I expect as we get to know the facts better in the months ahead, we'll better understand uh, what, if any, risk there was uh, to national security. Let's go back to that timeline there. That was an interesting graphic. November 2nd, 2022, Biden's lawyers find documents at the D.C. archive. They notify the National Archives. I don't know about that. I don't know that they notified the National Archives on that day. Maybe they did. I don't know. If they did... Then why did the National Archives notify the DOJ on the 4th? November 3rd was a Thursday. November 3rd was a Thursday. So if Biden's lawyers call the White House, the White House then calls what? The National Archives. The National Archives then calls the DOJ. What happened if for 24 hours or 48 hours on November 3rd? All right. We fast forward November 14th. All these documents are still floating around. A couple weeks later, we then get finally a new attorney who's appointed on the case, according to this graphic. I think our timeline's way better. December 20th, second batch of documents. January 9th, the story breaks. No, actually, yeah, the story breaks. More documents found. Special counsel appointed on the 12th. 
Fed will better understand uh, what, if any, risk there was uh, to national security. Of course, I respect the importance of proper handling of classified documents. And I think at this point, we're simply going to have to wait to hear uh, what the special counsel concludes. So even the president's closest Democratic confidants know this special counsel probe mm -hmm. may not go the president's way. Dana? Yeah, yep, not going to look out pair. so well. Hey, thanks, Peter, for, uh, for the great report over there on Fox News. That's Peter Ducey, folks, uh, on the uh, Watching the Watchers show. Thanks for tuning in. All right, so we've got Peter Ducey. Now, we are going to turn our attention over to Corrine Jean-Pierre because she gets just blown out of the water here today all afternoon by the media. You can see on the way out, she gets asked a final question, and it is a doozy. So we're going to go through all of that right after we talk about gold because, as you know, I like gold. And also, things are scary out there. The Biden administration, as we've talked a lot about here on this show, has already printed more money in the past two years than the previous 100 years combined. National debt, over $30 trillion. Inflation, highest we've seen since 1982. It's only a matter of time until this whole thing comes crashing down. And if you have retirement savings, your money could be at serious risk. That's why I invite you to talk to my friends at GoldCo to see how you can protect your retirement with gold and silver before it's too late. It's easy. You can go to robertlikesgold.com. They will give you $10,000 or more in free silver when you open a qualifying account. Easy, robertlikesgold.com. A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, great friends of the show, and it sometimes will even make you feel like this when you go to robertlikesgold.com. All right, and so now let's turn our attention to Kareen. Rough day for Kareen Jean-Pierre. Media, very unhappy with her. Before we listen to her have to clean up Joe Biden's mess, what did the president say about this? He got asked questions by some journos when he was meeting with some foreign diplomats in the White House. Here's what it sounded like. Sir, what are you A lot of document questions. President Biden clearly not taking questions. Uh, no, clearly <laughs> not taking of, questions. Uh, that meeting, meeting with the Dutch Prime Minister. Dutch Prime Minister, no questions. You can hear the media in the background. Hey, uh, Mr. Biden, did you have uh, confidential documents with the side of your eggs this morning, sir? Did you leave any confidential documents on the toilet after you exited the restroom? Are you missing any laptops or anything today? They're very concerned about this. He's not answering any questions. Now, the media has a lot to say about this. So Corrine Jean-Pierre walks in finally. And we've been waiting for her. They had the long benefit of a three-day weekend where they didn't have to answer any questions, but now they do. And the media started in hot. First question comes from this fella, followed up by another woman. They are both demanding to know more. What did you know, Corrine? When did you know it? We need answers. Okay. Regarding the, the, the discovery of classified and official documents at the president's residence in his former office, last week um, you told I think it was, I believe it was Phil that we all can assume, the American people could assume that the searches were complete and all the documents had been recovered. Uh, on Saturday, the White House Counsel's Office uh, uh, said that five additional classified documents had been found. Um, is it safe to assume now that all the documents are uh, uh, have been recovered, all the official records, all the classified documents? are back in the custody of the National Archives or are more searches on your way to find out if there's anything else there. Did you get all the documents or did, do you plan on more coming out of Biden's underwear? Look, I, I understand your question. We have addressed multiple questions from here. Multiple questions have been answered by the president. I know that you all uh, just spent about some of you, some of your colleagues, maybe you yourself, Zeke, was, was on the phone with my colleague for about 45 minutes that addressed a lot of your questions. 45 minute phone call, what? Why didn't they do that openly? What was in that information? Are they gonna publish the transcript of that call? Are they gonna publish the recording of that call with the White House counsel? 
What's all the detail there? Okay. Uh, I'm just going to continue to be prudent here. Uh, I'm going to let this ongoing uh, review that is happening, this legal process that is happening. All right, get uh, your and, shot glasses and, uh, out. Let that uh, let that process continue under the special counsel. We're not. I'm not going to comment. Get your bingo here. cards. Uh, I'm not. Uh, one of the things that we have said for the last two years when it comes to the department of justice when it comes to legal matters when it comes to legal issues uh, we have been very clear that we are not going to comment we are not going to uh, politically interfere and uh, and that continues with this also this legal issue and so i would refer you to the department of justice refer you to the special counsel as it relates to specifics on this issue and also my white house counsel colleagues are engaging with all of you and will certainly continue to have a uh, conversations on this i will say that uh, we are consistent with what we have said mm -hmm. on cooperating fully uh, with uh, the Department of Justice on this issue, and we, we will continue to cooperate fully with the special counsel. Great. Thanks, Grant. Uh, on Friday, you stood here, though, and were asked about this documents issued by our counsel 18 times. At that point, the president's lawyers had found these five additional pages of classified documents. So did you not know on Friday that those documents had been found when you were at the podium, or are you being directed by someone to not be forthcoming on this issue? Oh, I have boy, man. That is a spicy question. We're going to play that one more time. Kareen, hmm, you said here on Friday and you told us something, but then on Saturday, we learned that there's a whole slew of additional documents. So did you not know or were you being dishonest? Okay, now they're not going to call her an outright liar, okay? But they're saying that they don't have to say it without saying it. That's what she's saying. Are you lying to us at the direction of somebody else? Or did you not know? Like they're just not telling you because that's also crazy. You're the press secretary and the Biden administration has done this for a long time. They played this game. They told us they didn't know anything about Donald Trump. Merrick Garland is acting openly and independently. And you're going, what? Your, your department of justice attorney general is just indicting your political enemies. And you have no idea that's going on in your own administration. Okay. One more time, spice ball question. This is the second question she gets on this. You stood here though and were asked about this documents issued by our counsel 18 times. At that point, the times. president's lawyers had found these five additional pages of classified documents. So did you not know on Friday that those documents had been found when you were at the podium or are you being directed by someone to not be forthcoming on this issue? I, I have been forthcoming from this podium. Lying. What I uh, said yes to was what the statement at the time that we all had. Right. You all had the statement uh, and I was repeating what the what the uh, council was sharing at that time. Right, and had, so we had that statement. So we knew what was in it. But you also exactly knew. Did you not know that the I'm telling you, I just answered the question. I just said that I was repeating what the information that we had at that time. Right. That you all had. I was confirming from what the special counsel had provided to all of you and that we knew as well okay. from here. So, so then you very, didn't know. Very clear. Uh, and look. I've also been very clear about being prudent from here. I was also being very clear about being consistent from here uh, and not going uh, beyond uh, what is currently happening, right? And again, this is an ongoing, I also said this was an ongoing uh, review that was happening with the Department of Justice. Yeah, you did say that and like 30 times. as we know times. the special counsel, I've been very consistent about that as well. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, but your question to me is one of the reasons why I'm, I, we are being very, very careful and very mindful and to and not very silent, interfere here very uh, obstructive. and to make sure, to make sure that the Department Dishonest. of Justice has their independence. Your question actually proves that. There it is, and independence. that's why we're going to continue uh, to refer you to Department of Justice and Cheers. refer you to the special counsel or my colleagues is the president, at does, White House counsel. Does President Biden have confidence in the way his team is handling this with this trickle out of information and the documents being found day after day? I can tell you this. The president president has confidence. I can tell you this, that the president and his team uh, rightfully took action when they learned that the documents ex existed. They reached out to the archives. They reached out to the Department of Justice. After they reached out to the White House, right? The lawyers contacted the White House first. That is the steps. We have been very clear about that. The steps and the process. And there are issues with the attorneys rummaging through the documents. There's also been evidence that one lawyer shows up uh-oh, confidential documents. I don't have security clearance to look at these items. What do I do? He picks up the phone. He calls another lawyer. 
that lawyer flies down there. Turns out he doesn't have the security clearance either. And they're all rummaging around through a bunch of different documents now. And so people are asking themselves, is that how you're supposed to search for classified documents? You just say, uh, the, the National Archives just says, you're kidding me. You found another one? Well, that's weird. Yeah, just put it in the mail. Just drop it in the mail. We'll get it. Yeah, no, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, if you find anything else, yeah, just send it to us. Great. No, we don't pay for postage. You have to pay for that yourself. Yes, I know it's cheap. Okay, great. Don't call again. Bye. Right? It, it's not quite like that. Process uh, that we took here. Uh, and, uh, and look, we're going to continue. We're going to continue to, uh, uh, as we have said, fully cooperate with the Department of Justice. We're going to fully cooperate uh, with the president's team is going to fully cooperate with the special counsel. That does not stop. And that will just continue. Again, we are going to uh, respect the independence of the Department Would of Justice. Would you describe his mood to us and the conversations you've had with him on this issue? His, his mood has been very clear. I, I saw him this morning. He's very focused. He's vibrant. I, I was with, I traveled with him this weekend. He's lifting weights. He wants to make sure that he's continuing and we are continuing to deliver for the American people. And uh, we've been, you know, we've been con pretty consistent on that. If you think about last week, you heard from him about his, how his economic plan is working. All right. How unemployment numbers are also very, very concerned about. And What's the White House reaction to the news in Dnipro? Where All right. So that's the first clip. What did you know? When did you know it? Media comes out. She says, I knew what you knew when you knew it. Now that we're going to come back to that. That question comes back full circle when we get down to this question from this woman, because she says the same thing. You didn't, you didn't say yes or no on that one. And I want to know yes or no, because they're sort of acting like little prosecutors right now and they want answers. So do we, but let's carry on. Now, Kareen is sort of brushing this whole thing off. You know, we, hey, we've been open and transparent. We've been complying with the law. I'm going to be consistent here. We are respecting the independence of the Justice Department. The lawyers did the right thing. The president takes these documents seriously on repeat. But what about the cover-up? I mean, that all may be true. Why didn't they tell us about this back in November before the election? Why didn't they tell us about this in December after the second batch of documents? Why didn't they tell us about this at all? Why did CBS News have to break this story for us in the first place? From the most open, honest, transparent administration ever, a group of people who are adults in the room, who don't make mistakes like this, who castigated Donald Trump for this, they want to just sweep this all under the rug? Why shouldn't Americans be absolutely outraged by this hypocrisy and this total sham? The president weighed in on the issue a couple of times last week, but given the limitations, given what you've talked about from the podium, that we shouldn't expect the president to give his thoughts or opinions on the ongoing investigation. It is an, uh, and you just said it's an ongoing matter, right? This is an ongoing legal uh, process that's happening currently, and we are going to continue what we've been doing for the last two years, which is when it comes to the Department of Justice, when it comes to legal issues, we will not comment. We are going to be prudent from here. We are not going to political interfere politically interfere because one of the things that the president was very clear during the campaign and has been for the last two years is that we want to give back the the, um, the independence that the Department of Justice has. Go ahead, Peter, and then very I'll come to that. Just to follow up, if I can, very quickly on this. The White House says Republicans are faking outrage on this issue. Why shouldn't Americans be outraged Great about question. classified documents being found in a garage? Look. And I think I've been very clear about this. We have answered questions on this at this podium. You've heard, as Phil was saying twice from the president, talk about this. He said that he didn't know, right? He said that he was surprised. And he said that he takes classified information and documents very, very seriously. Not an explanation and not a defense. Would that be all it would take for Donald Trump to be excused from any criminal liability? Donald Trump should have just said, wow, no, I had no idea that they were there. I'm surprised about this. And gosh, you know what? I take these things seriously. And Kareem would have said, oh, that's exactly what we were looking for. All right, Donald Trump is, is innocent now. I mean, I guess he didn't know about it. He's surprised and he takes it seriously. Nothing we can do here. Case closed. Uh, no, people want, no, they want to know more. And in this case, where the documents come from, why did it take six years for us to find them? Why were his lawyers rummaging through them? Why didn't you guys tell us about any of this? before the election, much less after the fact. We heard directly from the president 
on this issue. Now, anything else, anything beyond that, uh, we're just not going to talk about. There's an investigation going on. There's a legal process here, as we've been very, very clear about. Uh, I will let the White House counsel uh, talk about any specific details uh, about that. Uh, but we're going to be prudent here and make sure that we are not uh, interfering in this process. I guess that's why I'm asking, though, because you've said that you don't want to interfere here and be prudent about the process. But the White House did post a statement saying, that Republicans are faking outrage. So to that point, why, why shouldn't Americans be upset about documents found in a garage? And that's for uh, that's for the American people to decide. Well, right? we're, that yeah, is for yeah. you all are, I'm sure, going to talk to many folks out there. But you said that people should be outraged about Trump, though. So does that also apply to your guy or no? Uh, and have that this conversation. But what we do know, right, what we do know from polling that we have seen over and over again, from your coverage, uh, from what we hear, what the president goes out and talk to the, talks to the American people, they also care about the economy, right? They also care about what is the president doing to lower costs, which is why he took hysteric, historic action. Uh, Back to the talking points. You think about the uh, energy costs, so I truly care about. As so she probably called Jen Psaki and she's like, listen, Jen, I'm having a hard time with this story. What do I do? And Jen's like, you can do it, Kareen. Listen to your big sister. You can do it. this. Just get out there and stick to your guns and go back and talk about all the bullet points of Joe Biden. He does a great job. Don't let them bully you, Kareen. You can do it. Now, another question came in. Is all of this scandal overshadowing the president? Because it seems like it's kind of a big deal. It's the only thing the media has really been asking about in the press briefings. They talked about Ukraine today. They talked about some other stuff, but it was all pretty much inconsequential relative to them being lied to by this administration. And I think, honestly, that's what irritates them so badly about this. Many of these people are on the record writing on their stories on their, you know, copy paste websites where they say, Trump is a monster and I'm outraged and this is the end of America and all this crap. And now Joe Biden does it. I mean, how embarrassing. Oh, so they're angry on this one and they want answers. And they're asking Corrine if this wrecks everything that they've worked for this up until this moment. Team had a pretty clear strategy and list of goals heading into this year. Is there any concern that that may be kind of overtaken by what's been happening over the course of the last week with the investigation? I mean, I just talked about last week uh, what uh, what we saw about with the economic plan. We saw the CPI data, and it's showing that inflation is indeed going down because of the president's economic. Uh, yeah, we'll see about that. We'll see how those numbers look in about eight months. You saw that for yourselves. Uh, how the president was able to bring both sides together to talk about an issue that was so important uh, for that region in Kentucky, to talk about infrastructure, uh, something in the last administration been able to do it. We're going to have a, a All right, mayor. so we're going to exit that clip. Now, I think it is overshadowing the president, as we heard from all of the consultants. But there are some additional questions before Kareen absolutely gets hammered by the two individuals that we'll get to. First question for her, you know, they're still looking around for all these documents and they just keep popping up like they're falling out of Biden's trousers as he's walking off the airplanes. And is he looking for these things too? Like, honestly, is, is the president going through his folders? Has he written a log, check here, check here? Is he going through his emails? You know, when you forget like a, a, that thing you have to find and you're like, oh, man, where was it? check there and over there and in that box and in that drawer is the president doing any of that documents if you don't mind uh, given these documents have shown up in very personal spaces we all know that the president uh, you know loves his delaware home it's an extremely personal space for him is he physically joining in the search for these things rummaging around you know these boxes in the garage and wherever else i mean literally are you are you are you listening to your the question that you're asking me it's a good question okay look look in searching for his own documents. look i'm going to be very consistent here uh i am going to be very clear here uh as i have been for the is past is he working on him or days, not a week now uh dealing with this uh you know, we are going to any specific questions that you have about this issue. I would refer you to my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office who spent almost an hour taking these questions from all of you, many of your colleagues. I'm going to let you ask that question to the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, and anything else specific to this, I refer you to Department of Justice. I refer you to Special uh, Counsel. Okay. No answers uh, on that one. So Biden is probably not rummaging around anything. But his lawyers, they certainly are. They are making sure they're looking in all of the crevices 
from Biden's 35 years of government wreckage. And the question is, was that appropriate? Should these lawyers who didn't have any security clearances have been doing that? Corinne. Corinne. Yes. Thank you, Corinne. I just want to ask you, sir, I just want to ask you about something you said last week. Last week, you were pretty insistent that you believe that the president's attorneys did the right thing. Do you still believe that? Yes, they did the right thing when it comes to making sure that when the documents were found, uh, they um, handed it over to the archivist and it was handed over to Department of Justice. But again, Steve, I'm going to be very prudent here. I am going to be very consistent. Steve was the guy last week who said, what did you know and when did you know it? And, you know, sometimes press secretaries get called in in front of different committees and different commissions when there's a gigantic cover up. Were you involved in this? It is a personal lawyer statement. Now, no, the, the president is, is, is I'm not going to say more. Uh, but I, the reason I ask is, is that what we now know, the, the president's counsel statement, the president's personal lawyer statement shed a bit more light on this, but they raised more questions. Right. Uh, namely, the first call that the president's personal attorneys made on November 2nd was not to the FBI huh. that they had found what we now know were top secret documents out in the open. The first call was to officials here at this White House in the West Wing. Oh. How is that the right thing? Is that the right thing when you see some, if you're a lawyer and you're, you don't have a security clearance and you see a classified document, shouldn't you call the Justice Department's National Security Office right away? Again, I yes, you should. And that's what they keep trying to tell us. No, Kareen said earlier in this press briefing, she said, oh, no, 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 no. They contacted the FBI. They contacted the National Archives. They contacted the special, you know, whatever. Uh, no, they called the White House. Okay, that's what he said there. That's what everybody has been reporting, but they, they like to paper over that little fact. That initial call was from lawyers to the White House. It wasn't to the FBI. And we have that documented in the mind map. It's right here. Pat Moore or whomever was there called the White House. National Archives evidently made the phone call after that on November 4th back over to the prosecutor. I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel's Office, that is something for them to answer. That is a very specific question uh, that they should answer, that they will engage you with, engage with on you on this, just like my colleague did for almost an hour and had this conversation with all of you. Almost an hour, which we don't hear any of that. Like, don't have any idea what that conversation was about. Let me, let me widen out. Why is it the matter of this White House Counsel deal with documents from two administrations ago? These are, we're not talking about presidential records from this White House. Why is this White House counsel involved in this matter at all? Again, this is something for the White House counsel uh, to address. I am not going to address that from here. You're the press you secretary for the I'm White House. The special... It's the White House counsel, Corrine. Counsel and anything that's that is specific to this particular issue. All right, you see her take a, a big, deep breath. And she's going to need it because these final two questions are coming in hot. This one comes in from this woman and others. They're really trying to dial in on the dates. Kareen, when did you know? What did you know? Who told you? Who did you tell? What was your involvement in concocting a narrative? Thanks, Kareen. I want to follow up on Cecilia's question. And sorry if I missed it, but... Cecilia's question was, why did you stand here on Friday and tell us one thing? Did you know about the other documents that showed up on Saturday, one, or were you told to lie about it? It was the first question in the first clip from her we read today. This person is following up on that question. Thanks, I want to follow up on Cecilia's question, and sorry if I missed it, but on Friday, did you or did you not know about the additional files? I, I already, I literally just answered that question. You didn't though. But I, I, I missed just, it, so is it yes or well, no? Well, I, I mean, you're you're not too far sitting next to her, so I was very clear. I provided I provided the information that you all had at the time, and know. I confirmed. No, I did not know. I'm saying I had the information. I actually said this to Cecilia. I, I didn't know. So she didn't know about those five documents. She's saying I had the, literally the same info you had. I had the information that you all had at the time, right? And so this is why I also said to Cecilia, this is why we are trying to be very prudent here and we're trying to be very consistent and say this is an ongoing uh, legal process. And this is why I say we're just not going to comment from here. That is a perfect example in Cecilia's question. 
Ukraine. And I was very clear about that. You weren't, actually. What did you learn about the documents found at the Penn Center in November and in Wilmington in December? Great when question. When your team was, in, was uh, doing a story on it. When? Um, because I was also asked a similar question about if our team has been engaged on this. And I've been very clear, this is something that the White House counsel is handling. This is something that uh, is being handled by the president's uh, lawyers and been very clear. That's why we are, this is why we are being prudent here. This is why we are being consistent with what we have done the last She's, two years when it comes to DOJ, I didn't know anything. Justice investigation. We are just not going to interfere. Well, on that, no on that note, you've repeatedly emphasized the need, just as you did today, for independence, for integrity um, of the Department of Justice investigation, one reason why you continue to point us to the DOJ. So I wonder why, then, did the White House counsel go to Wilmington to facilitate the handing over of documents to the DOJ? Great that question. That is, that separating the White House from the DOJ? And Weijia, I appreciate the questions. I know there's going to continue to be dozens more questions probably yeah, today. And will. I will say, reach out to the White House Counsel's Office. That's one of the reasons my colleague was uh, on the phone with many of you taking questions uh, today. And I'm just going to leave it there. That is something for them to answer. Okay, but All right, so Corrine is saying she found out right about the same time as the story was published. So. If we check out the mind map and zoom in on this, she's saying literally right around the same time as January 9th. January 9th, 2023 is the date where Kareem Jean-Pierre found out, more or less, right around the same time the rest of the country found out when CBS broke the story. Pretty amazing. So Joe Biden and his lawyers, the White House counsel, all of them, they were rummaging around they were the ones covering all of this up. Karine Jean-Pierre had nothing to do with it. She saw the story. They, she said, oh, what's going on? What are you guys? Oh, confidential documents? Oh, okay, you guys just figure all of that out. I have no idea about any of it. It's related to something that you keep telling us, which is how much it is important to this White House to separate the White House from the DOJ's investigation. But the <laughs> White House counsel was the one <laughs> to go and facilitate the documents, to look for the documents. Again, they the White House sent their lawyer to go clean up the mess. They didn't separate themselves from the DOJ and let them independently go clean things up. They've been saying and screaming at us. Independence, transparency. But why did their lawyer go and clean it all up? It's like letting the person who's charged with the crime go back to the crime scene and clean it all up. If you really want an independent analysis and you really honor the process, why would you send somebody with such a massive conflict of interest who's gonna cover up for your butts? They have been working very closely with the Department of Justice. I would refer you to them. If you want to know specifically about their actions, specifically about what they're doing, I would point you to the White House Counsel's Office. Look. Guys, you guys can ask me this a hundred times, 200 times if you I wish. I hope they do. I'm going to keep saying the same thing. I hear your question. It's been asked. It's been answered. It's been noted. And we're just going to try to move on here. Uh, and we're going to move on. One no, you're not. Yeah, we're going to move on. One false more. Information. One more. Um, because Ian Did you hear that question? Somebody said you gave us false information. Listen. White House Counsel's Office. Look. Guys, you guys can turn ask me this a hundred times, two hundred times if you wish. I'm going to keep saying the same thing. I hear your question. It's been asked. It's been answered. It's been noted. And we're just going to try to move on here. Uh, and here it comes. we're going to move on. One we're going to move on. Badly, we're going to move on. One more. False information. One more. One more um, because Ian did have that call today. And he yeah. said that the White House would, quote, fully cooperate um, with the investigation. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that President Biden uh, is willing to be interviewed if called. I'm just not going to. You're asking no, of course not. a question that no. should go to the White House Counsel's no, Office, as you no, just said. No, he's not going to be interviewed. Uh, Get out of here. To, to my colleague just moments ago. That is something that the White House Counsel's Office should be answering. Uh, any spe anything specific to the DOJ or special counsels, uh, 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 what they're doing, uh, you need to reach out to them. Go ahead, Tam. Yeah. Um, we go. Are you upset that you came out to this podium on Friday with incomplete and inaccurate information? Ooh. And are you concerned that it affects your 
credibility up here. Well, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is making sure that we do not politically interfere in the Department of Justice, that we continue uh, to be consistent over the That's last two years. That's your whole operation. And, uh, and that is uh, continue to refer you all when it comes to an ongoing process. Uh, and uh, and I'll just leave it there. And let's not. Let's go back to that question. Um, Kareen, do you feel bad for being so terrible and dishonest at your job, for coming out here on Friday and providing us with false information? Um, are you upset that you came out to this podium on Friday with incomplete and inaccurate information? Hmm. And are you concerned that it affects your credibility up here? Well, what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is making sure that we do not politically interfere in the Department of Justice, that we continue uh, to be consistent over the last two years. And uh, and that is uh, continue to refer you all when it comes to an ongoing process. Uh, and uh, and I'll just leave it there. And let's not yeah. forget, there was actually a statement from uh, the council's office uh, that you all had at the same time as well. I'm, I'm just not going to go down uh, any rabbit hole here. I'm gonna be very consistent. I'm gonna be very prudent and uh, again, uh, I've been asked, just asked that question. I've answered it. Uh, it's been noted, the question, and we're just going to move on. She noted. Uh, thanks. So just to clarify on the debt ceiling again. Back over to the debt ceiling now. Are you embarrassed? Are you ashamed? Do you feel bad that you're doing such a terrible job? Now, she doesn't want to take any more questions, but she gets one on the way out. Before making a beeline for the door, Kareem Jean-Pierre gets one final question lobbed at her, and you have to listen closely on the way out. We have to, folks have to gather. Okay, folks have to gather. I'll see you guys tomorrow. You told me six times that turned out to be false. Are you sorry about that? I'll see you tomorrow. Come talk to me. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, man. Are you sorry about that? You stood here and told us six times. Are you sorry about that? Have to gather. Okay, folks have to gather. I'll see you guys tomorrow. That turned out to be false. Are you sorry about that? I'll see you tomorrow. Oh man, you can super slow mo that. You can almost see the heartbreak when she realizes it's true. Uh, are you sorry about standing there and lying to us six times in a row? And you see the facial expression. Let's see if we can freeze for, oh, there it is. There it is. Shame, shame, shame. I'll see you guys tomorrow. You told me that turned out to be false. Are you sorry about that? I'll see you tomorrow. Come talk to me. We'll see you tomorrow too, Kareen. We will talk to you tomorrow. We'll see what you have to say for yourself. Shame, shame. All right, so that is the White House. Now they had a tough day, as you can see. You should feel bad, you are bad, you should feel bad, and you should always feel bad, is basically what the media told her accurately, I think. Now the politicos are, of course, responding, the politicians themselves. We've got Raskin, who is a Democrat, who's no longer on the January 6th Select Committee, but he is still slippery. He is out and he's commenting now on this debacle, the Biden document dilemma. Jamie Raskin weighs in. Well, speaking of political footballs, take a listen to President Biden's reaction last year when he was asked on 60 Minutes about the classified documents yeah, found irresponsible. at Trump's home in Mar-a-Lago. Irresponsible. How that could possibly happen. Happen. How one, yeah. anyone could be that irresponsible. Uh, 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 and I uh, thought, uh, what uh, data was in there that may compromise sources and methods? Just uh, totally uh, irresponsible. Uh, now we learned that President Biden had roughly 20 classified documents, 20? including some marked top secret oh! in three different locations three? by Biden's own standard. Oh, man. Wasn't Biden totally irresponsible <laughs> with classified information? Good question, Jake. Who are these Who are these, these anchors? Did, did Klaus Schwab upgrade his chip or something? And aren't we right to wonder, to use Biden's words, quote, what data was in there that may compromise sources and methods? Well, and I think we'll get to the bottom of all of that. What are you going to get to? That's why special counsel uh, has been appointed by oh. Attorney General Merrick Garland. He did the right <laughs> thing there to look into it. Um, 
you know, I'm hoping that we will keep a sense of symmetry about our analysis of these situations and a sense of proportion about the underlying offenses. There's some people who are trying to compare keep our uh, symmetry? having a government document um, that should no longer be in your possession to inciting uh, a violent insurrection against the government of the United States. And those are Gosh. obviously completely different things. <laughs> oh, That's apples gosh. and oranges. So we should keep a, a sense of proportion. Is that why they raided his house? Because of the violent insurrection? And measure about what we're talking about. Uh, the the uh, first press, just this, that, he says, we loved and we've learned Asian. Well, of course, I mean, it was a very rapid clip at which we learned about it compared to the Trump case where he fought it for nearly a year or perhaps over a year. And, it, and uh, the government investigators had to go to court in order to get a subpoena to go to Mar-a-Lago to get uh, dozens of boxes of classified material and government documents that were being held down there. So, look, I don't know yet, and I'm hoping our investigations will reveal what you're supposed to do if one of these documents uh, surfaces. Obviously, what you do, if, 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 evidently, if you're the White House, is you send your lawyers down there with a shredder. Just give them a big box and just say, you don't come out of that room until you're done. Evidently. Uh, presidents and vice presidents are able to take those documents while they are president or vice president home with them. And if some of them get mixed in with their other stuff, well, then they're there. And then the question is, oh. what do you do with them afterwards? Oh, and I've man. not seen uh, a set of protocols or procedures that defines what exactly should happen. But I'm satisfied that <laughs> President Biden's lawyers did the right thing in mm. immediately contacting the archives and turning them over, as well as over to the Department of Justice. Or Wow. All right. So Jake Tapper asked a fun question of Ol Rasky, and he had a difficult time answering that one. Now we'll check in with Ilhan Omar before we hear from some of the Republicans. She was asked about this over on MSNBC. Ilhan Omar weighing in on the Biden document dilemma. Uh, six pages now, no additional pages. 20. Uh, of classified 20. documents of having up been to found 20. at President Biden's home in Delaware. Well, one, I'm glad that there is a special prosecutor that's oh. been appointed to investigate You are glad that there is a special this. prosecutor. Yes, Tell me because why. Because anytime there is a deviance uh, in regards to security protocols that should be taken serious, it should be investigated. What I find I guess. interesting is that Republicans oh. who have defended Trump after he literally stole classified documents, refused to turn them over, lied about having them, made up some story about how he declassified them, had to he have was, his house president. raided in order for those documents to be found, are now only interested in investigating Biden, who has cooperated, who his own staff and former staff have themselves turned these documents in. So you have to understand, right, Republicans aren't really interested in upholding the law in following security protocols. What they're interested in is playing a political game in now only wanting to investigate Biden. Mm. They're playing your political game, weirdo. That's the whole point. You said this was a gigantic deal. They made a mockery of the whole thing. I think most Republicans are probably also making a mockery of Joe Biden. You know, he, he had some documents in his garage. Is the country going to melt down? I don't think so. Just like we didn't think so when Trump had him either. You people were hysterical about it. The reason why Republicans are demanding action against Biden is not because of the, necessarily the legitimacy of the underlying charge. It's because you raided the former president, Trump. That's the only reason. Because you initiated all of this. You kicked the Republicans in the nads first. They're kicking you in the nads back. They're not going to sit there and kick themselves in the nads, okay? You're asking them to do that. You kick them in the nads, they're kicking you in the nads back. You both kick each other in the nads all day. And that's how this game is played. So it's not hypocritical. They're asking you to be adhere, adhering to your own standards. It's not even complicated. But they keep having a difficult time with this. Yes, Joe Biden's house should be raided by the FBI. Then he can use the same defenses that Donald Trump did. It's all fair, man. He can use the same defenses. We grant him that. He can say he magically un, you know, undid him. He can say whatever. It, it, it's fine. He was the vice president, so he doesn't even have those same defenses, but 
He can say it after his house is raided. We'll see if that happens. Now, the Republicans are also weighing in on this. James Comer hit CNN also. He was, I think, appearing alongside slippery Jamie Raskin. This is what Comer had to say about it. But I just want to be clear here. Are you accusing President Biden or anyone on his team of breaking the law? Well, we don't know exactly. Of course. Yes, simply being in possession of documents, according to the Democrats, was a violation of the law. Even Bill Barr said that. We played all the clips here. And I got you know, criticism for that, for saying that there was a high likelihood of an indictment because we read the statutes and you said you can indict a ham sandwich over this stuff. And they were intending to do that. Like they created this whole prosecution out of nothing. And you, you know how they created it out of nothing because they're not doing the same thing with Joe Biden who did worse. So it's, it's obvious, but Comer's being very coy here and he's playing a long, long game. I'm sure. Uh, yet whether they broke the law or not, I will accuse the Biden administration of not being transparent. Why didn't we hear about this on November 2nd when the first batch of classified documents were discovered? Remember, uh, they were quick to call for a special counsel prior to the midterm elections. And Joe Biden used a str as his closing argument during the midterm elections that yeah. Republicans were a threat to democracy. And he cited the, the fact that uh, President Trump mishandled the, the documents. That's While right. While he was doing this, he knew very well that he himself had possession of classified documents. So the so I think that would have been, yeah, that's awesome. So I think Comer delivered on that ask that we were talking about. I'm guessing, I'm guessing there's a speech from Joe Biden that happened after November 2nd, but before the November 8th midterms, where he gave a speech about extremist MAGA. I don't know when it was. And in that speech, he said something about the Mar-a-Lago documents. It happened after November 2nd with he, when he should have been on notice that he had the same document problem. I want to find that clip. Hypocrisy here is great. We're very concerned about a lack of transparency. We're very concerned, as I've said many times, about a two-tier system of justice in America. And we just want equal treatment. And hopefully we'll get some answers very soon. So just to... Give the this given the Fernies this November. There's a boo. Uh, are uh, hard to believe. I would consider that the fact that it was right before a midterm election, a very important midterm election that was close, that was going to determine the balance of power in Congress. Uh, the fact that they had uh, they were quick to call for a special counsel with with Trump. Uh, you know, it it. it seems political here. It seems uh, hypocritical. It seems like a double standard. And, and that's our concern. I have jurisdiction as chairman of the House Oversight Committee over the National Archives. Oh, we're this excited is the for agency that. That, that, that I'm most frustrated with, to be honest with you, Jake, because they have not been transparent at all. Uh, they should be briefing both myself and now ranking member Raskins, who will be your next guest on the show, about what's going on here. They never did Raskins? tell us about November 2nd. <laughs> We've asked questions about uh, what went on with mar largo Why was mar largo raided, but uh, the president's home not? Why are the president's lawyers still allowed to go rummage through looking for documents after a special counsel has been appointed? It yeah. doesn't make sense. It's not fair. We just want equal treatment. Equal treatment, that's all anyone's asking for. Trump didn't get that same benefit of the doubt. Why should Joe Biden? One house is all we're asking for. One house to be raided and things will be a lot more even handed. I, I would be a lot more satisfied. Soon as we see FBI walking out with Jill Biden's uh, whatever. Who made that decision? Oh yeah, this is Chris Christie. Remember him? Ron Klain make that decision? Who made the decision not to disclose? Not to disclose. Did Ron Klain make the decision? Good question. Did the president make the decision? Good question. Who made the decision to not tell the American people six days before an election? And if Donald Trump had not told people six days before an election, what would the conversation be about right now? I guarantee you it would be about cover-up. It is about a cover-up right now. We're all talking about it. This time it's about the Biden administration doing it. Why didn't Corrine Jean-Pierre know about it? Who made the decision not to tell her about it? Are they trying to exit Joe Biden? Don't know. We'll, of course, continue to cover. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you for subscribing and liking this video wherever it is you're watching it. We're going to continue to follow this Biden confidential documents dilemma story wherever it may lead, and we hope you join us. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next one. All right, and so, my friends, 
Now that we've wrapped that one up, let's turn our attention over to Davos and the World Economic Forum because we've got a lot to talk about. Klaus Schwab launches the World Economic Forum annual event in Davos. We're going to go through some of the clips and highlights from the event. But he, of course, is often compared to Dr. Evil, Dr. Doom. If you're not familiar with the World Economic Forum, let me give you a little bit of a montage background here. This is Klaus Schwab, the founder in this video clip where he's explaining about the utility of the World Economic Forum and how they're gonna help us live through an impending cyber catastrophe. Pay insufficient attention to the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack, which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19 crisis would be seen in this respect as a small disturbance in comparison to a major cyber attack. That doesn't sound good. Are they planning for that? Okay, well, okay. Well, here's another individual who is often associated with the World Economic Forum. This is a montage from several individuals spliced together. This is a person called Kristalina Georgieviva, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. We're also going to hear from Yuval Harari. This fella here, Yuval Noah Harari, is uh, an advisor over to Klaus Schwab. He's written several different books. This is Gordon Brown over uh, talking about the Great Reset and so on. Let's listen to this clip. We are advocating to think about this world of digital money as a global public good. When protocols are, are agreed, it, this public plat platform can connect different CBDCs. I mean, Central bank digital currencies, the government digital money. COVID makes it, it accelerates the process of digitalization and, and automatization, and it makes surveillance go under your skin. Mm. Great. You just imagine the situation when everybody goes around all the time with some biometric bracelet. It's going to be the fourth industrial revolution, an all-consuming industrial revolution right across the board. The speed of change a thousand times faster than during the first industrial revolution wow. and affecting uh, all services, all products, all countries, all industries and all people. It's going to lead to job destruction, so we've got to think about the jobs of the future and how we create them. It's going to lead to massive uh, technological change in the way we deliver uh, services. It's going to force governments to change their minds about how they operate. And all this has been set out by Klaus Schwab in the speech he made uh, in Abu Dhabi. And you see, the difference of this forced uh, industrial revolution is it doesn't change what you are doing. It changes you if you take a change. So you see, we have some interesting conversations from Klaus Schwab, a doom montage of Dr. Evil himself. Now, the World Economic Forum is a big entity, and we've talked about this here many times, so I'm not going to belabor the point on this, but I've made the argument previously that it is such a big organization, I think it rivals most governments, if not all governments, right? If you take a look at the total amount of GDP of the globe, and you say, what is China output in terms of GDP? What is the United States output in terms of GDP? Well, the way the World Economic Forum works, it's sort of like a little club of all of the biggest corporations in the world. And so let's say if China has a $14 trillion GDP, for example, then there are certain companies that if you added up their, their throughput, sort of their market cap or, or their g total revenue, pick a metric, it doesn't matter. But if you sort of gauge the size of all of these companies and you added them all up, okay, you take a couple hundred billion dollar companies, you add them up, all of the biggest in the world, would that rival the $14 trillion sort of assets under management type of concept, GDP of a country? And if you do the math on it, it's, I think it's 5,000 companies that are a part of the World Economic Forum and they all have to meet a certain threshold of revenue in order to qualify. And if you add it all up, we did the math, depending on the total volume of the com companies that are involved in this organization, I think it's bigger than China, 
arguably bigger than the United States because it's basically all of the GDP of all of the 5,000 biggest corporations in the world. In other words, they have more under management than many countries. If you, if you bundle all the corporations together, it's like this superstructure that exists over the nation state structure all across the globe. Massive. That's why when they hold these events, everybody in the world drops what they're doing and they show up. The last time we talked about this, President Xi from China showed up and spoke there. Did you ever hear him speak before? Have you ever heard him come outside of China and say anything? No, he doesn't go anywhere except the World Economic Forum. Why? Because he knows who's in charge. This is Klaus Schwab. We have a bit of an introduction from him. Klaus Schwab arrives at Davos, the World Economic Forum annual event, and details for us his vision for 2023 and the future. Thank you, Angelic and Amen, for this uh, musical opening of the meeting. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, distinguished heads of state and government, Excellencies, dear partners and friends of the World Economic Forum, a very cordial welcome to the 2023 annual meeting. We are coming together under the motto, Cooperation in a Fragmented World. At the beginning of this year, we are confronted with unprecedented and multiple challenges. First, our global economy is undergoing deep transformation. The energy transition, the consequences of COVID, the reshaping of supply chains are all serving as catalytic forces for the economic transformation. And we're all asking ourselves why we are experiencing this transition, why supply chains are wrecked, why inflation is through the roof, why the world seems to be disorderly in a, and in a state of perpetual war. Where did all that come from? And who took advantage of that? And who was guiding the ship over the last several years. These people, all of them, where was that stupid Build Back Better plan? Where did that come from that all of our idiot so-called leaders across this planet were waking up every day, Justin Trudeau, Joe Biden, Angela Merkel, all of them, Build Back Better, Build Back Better, Build Back Better, all day. Where did it all originate from? Who was pulling the puppet strings and orchestrating all of this across the world? These people, they had the Great Reset. They were going to fix everything for us. We fast forward a couple of years and everything's worse, right? These are supposed to be, according to some people out there, these very sophisticated engineers, these economists and these global strategic thinkers who run some of the most powerful companies in the world who are going to go out there and show us all how to do it right and fix the problems and push past all of our hardship and economic downturn trials and tribulations. They've been running things. They're in charge. And things are about as bad as they've ever been, right? Eggs are a luxury these days, right? We're seeing ebbs and flows in the economy. We'll see how it works out. But he's supposed to have the solutions. And he's detailing all of the problems. And so hotspots of this geo-economic remodeling a high inflation, high inflation, increasing interest rates. You caused all of that national with, debt. with your lockdowns and your mandates and this your insane spending demands. Low and middle income groups. It is exacerbating societal fragmentation. Yeah, your environmental Second, insanity. The geopolitical system is also undergoing deep systemic transformation. Because his agency has been penetrating the global cabinets for many years. Internationally, we are moving to what some people would call a messy patchwork of powers. There are superpowers, 
emerging powers, middle powers, regional powers, rogue states, and also large corporate and social media powers, all competing increasingly for power and influence. Yes, these are different structures of societal control and organization. And we talk often about this concept of the network state, which is a, an idea I first learned about from a guy called Balaji Srinivasan. You can read the book at thenetworkstate.com. And he explained in that book that, you know, society has gone through different evolutionary structures. For example, we used to be sort of like hunter gatherers, right? You've heard about that. Not a whole lot of structure, just small little communities that would hunter and gather. You also heard about barbarians. You heard about the Roman state and the Greek state where they had multiple gods. You heard about sort of the religious states under the Catholic church and sort of religion as an organizing structure for society. Then we move past all of that, right? Evolved into this concept of the nation state where we have written constitutions and so on. But is that the end of history? Like, do we just stop at the nation state? Is that where we stop? We go from barbarians to religious states to nation, you know, city states to nation states? Or, or is there another evolution? Well, he just detailed it for us, right? He talked about corporate powers and social media powers that aggregate more people together in a way that is more powerful than the country itself. The social media power connects more people than many countries do. Facebook connects over billions of people. More people are under Facebook's purview than under the United States purview. And they know that. And they want to control at that level. It doesn't have to be at the governmental level. It has to be at a higher level they control. You don't have to vote for that level of control. They just get to take it. As a result, the trend is again moving towards increased fragmentation and confrontation. Thirdly, our generation has reached a turning point confronted by truly existential problems. Climate change, yeah. exploitation of nature, nuclear possible incidents, or even worse, extreme poverty and viruses. Extreme poverty, viruses, nuclear threats, inflation. They all can lead to an extension, extinction of large parts of our global population. Extinction! And we have seen how much <laughs> dealing with those risks, such as COVID or global warming, have again fragmented populations. What are you going to do about it? Shut everybody the fourth up. industrial revolution offers us tremendous opportunities. But at the same time, technologies as computing, quantum computing, blockchain, genetics, and so on, they also could create deep societal fragmentation. Blockchain, genetics. We have the ability to collaboratively build a more peaceful, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable world. But to do so, we need to overcome the most critical fragmentation. What is that? And the most critical fragmentation is between those who take a constructive attitude and those who are just bystanders, observers, and even go into the negative, critical, and confrontational attitude. Oh. But the spirit of that. Those confrontational naysayers. How dare they? That was just positive. It's constructive. It means investing into a greener and therefore more sustainable economy, investing into a more cohesive society by providing everyone with the appropriate skills and opportunities, investing into the hard and soft infrastructure that modern societies require. And here in Davos, it means despite all those challenges, it means particularly 
investing in the spirit and the practice of solving problems through mutual respect and cooperation. We believe that we can do it, that through collective responsibility, innovation, human goodwill and ingenuity, we have the capacity to turn the challenges into opportunities. All we have to do is do everything they say and everything will work out. Now, it looked like that was pretty full. Of course, he was there in person. Uh, evidently, when they are doing video conferences, the room is actually pretty empty. So you can see here, this was a world leader, I guess, who was uh, speaking. Everybody kind of cleared out. So Klaus was there. I don't know who this guy is, but he's speaking and the room is basically empty. So it looks a lot smaller, I think, than they're letting on. Like it's not bursting with people or overflowing with people to get in there. Now, again, right, that could be taken out of context. Who knows? But we've got another clip from Klaus Schwab before we check in with Carrie Gore and others who are there. This question comes in about the metaverse. Is this something that you're willing to get plugged into? Hello, a question to Mr. Schwab. I think the metaverse is a great tool to reinvent the way we work. But in general, my question is in the moment, we see a quite a big decline in trust in political People don't trust the metaverse. What do you think about that? In meeting here in Davos, at what extent do you think this can strengthen to try build this trust again? I I would refer afterwards uh, uh, also to Brad Smith. I think what what is essential is to make sure that um, the system as such, uh, the technology, uh, can be trusted and. Um, um, one of the on one of the village partner, for example, is Interpol. So we work together already um, with the necessary instances to make sure that the system is as safe as it can hmm. as it can be. Yeah, they're working with Interpol, which of course is a government law enforcement association. And why is the World Economic Forum working with them with Interpol? And why are they inviting? U.S. law enforcement officials over there to come and present. Representative Dan Bishop, congressman from North Carolina, asked a very interesting question. He says, why is the FBI director, Christopher Wray, attending Davos at the World Economic Forum? Isn't he the FBI director for the United States here in America? Why is he in Switzerland hanging out with Klaus? World Economic Forum posted their invitees, including their public speakers. January 19th, look who's going to be giving a speech. Christopher Ray, director, FBI. Interesting. We also have the CEO of Cloudflare, along with the CEO of Gecko Robotics and others, including the global editorial director of Wired Magazine. Christopher Ray hanging out with Klaus Schwab. Sounds perfectly appropriate. Now we're gonna hear from Al Gore, he was there speaking along with John Kerry, and then we'll check in with this fellow who says you don't even need to own anything. Before we hear about this little altercation with the police that took there as a little show of force happened on the streets outside of Davos. But before we jump into any of that, let's make sure that we're prepared for our potential downturns by looking at four patriots Dot com. And that is where you can go and get an amazing offer from a gr very good sponsor of this program. Let's listen to what they have for us. My friends, a food shortage could be coming. Even in the United States, experts have written about this as recently as July. Drought, inflation, even new policies are pushing America's food supply near its breaking point. That's why survival food is more important now than ever. And you can create your own stockpile of the best-selling four Patriot survival food kits ever. This is not ordinary food. We're talking about good for 25 years, super survival food. Hand-packed right in family-owned facilities in the United States, giving jobs to over 200 Americans. The kits are compact, they're sturdy, they're water-resistant, and they stack easily. They have different delicious breakfast, lunches, and dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, you can go to 4Patriots.com, 
Use code Robert to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including this three month survival kit. You'll get their famous guarantee for an entire year on anything in the store, plus free shipping on, you know, the rest of it. They're called donated to charities go. who support our veterans and their families. Go to fourpatriots.com. Use code Robert to get 10% off. That's fourpatriots.com. Use code Robert. Start building your own stockpile today. That's right. Go to fourpatriots.com. Become an, an amazing chef with your food at fourpatriots.com. Don't forget to use code Robert. All right. Now, as we go back over to the World Economic Forum, you remember this guy? The guy who flies around on private jets and has like 35 houses, Al Gore. He was there at the World Economic Forum. Al Gore is still fighting climate change. And here's what he said with Klaus. Enough already. Enough. Ah. And I, I don't want to get sidetracked on to what needs to happen, but we need to scale up climate finance, but we need desperately to scale down anti-climate finance. Oh. And we are still subsidizing the burning of fossil fuels globally at a rate 42 times larger than the subsidies for the shift toward renewables and EVs, uh, <clears throat> et cetera. We need new leadership at the World Bank. We need them to uh, scale up the leverage and vastly increase the amounts that are, are committed. And we need to rein in the anti-climate activities of the fossil industry. Got to shut everybody up. Make sure they can't participate in the debate. Cut their money out from under them. And, you know, Al Gore, he's talking about sustainability. He might want to sustain himself on those uh, chips and ice cream out there. Looking a little bit thick on the uh, video screen. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but he's ranting and raving. You can see what they're talking about. Other weirdos like John Kerry were also there. And, you know, these people... They think that they are literal gifts to humanity. They walk around so in love with themselves. They think that their existence and their brain power and their solutions are saving the world. This clip came over from the very great at Drew H Live. He's on Twitter and he's been clipping some good clips on this. Make sure you go follow him and support him. He's also on YouTube at Drew H Live. But here is what he clipped from John Kerry, who thinks that the people in this room are God's gift to the planet. And when you stop and think about it, it's pretty extraordinary. It is. That we select group of human beings because of no, whatever touched us at some point in our lives, Joe are Biden. able to sit in a room and come together and um, actually talk about saving the planet. I mean, it's so wow. almost extraterrestrial wow. to think about quote, saving the planet. And if you said that to most people, most people, they think you're just a crazy tree-hugging, lefty, liberal, you know, do-gooder, whatever. And we think you're a psychopath, narcissist, lunatic, that you're going to save the planet, weirdo. And there's no relationship. But really, that's where we are. Did Joe Biden touch him, I think? Is that what he said? That we select group of human beings because of whatever touched us at some point in our lives. Yeah, Joe Biden did it. Yeah, Joe Biden. That's the, that's the cause, right? You trace it all back to the one source. Joe Biden's been touching people in Washington for 40 years. <laughs> Where did he touch you, John? <laughs> Show me on the doll where he touched you, John. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. All right. Well, over at the World Economic Forum, we have this fella who probably flew in on a private jet. He's going to scream at all of us that we own too much crap. This is a member of the National Council from the Swiss Parliament. His name is Bastian Girard. Let's hear what Bastian has to say for us all. Important for, for policy is really to change the, the rules of the game, no? So that uh, sustainability becomes <laughs> the easier choice, not just for the people, but also for the companies, no? Yeah, so also then um, 
changing the way districts work. For instance, um, I, in Zurich, we have a lot of districts where you actually don't need a car because all the activities, you no know, school, um, uh, buying something, everything you can do in walking distance. You no, know? and by doing that, you no know, people don't buy a car, and it, 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 it's not felt like um, actually they would like to have a car and, that, and they are not allowed to have it, but they simply don't need it because the environment was built in a way that they don't need it. And I think- Is he talking about a big city like New York? Wow. This is what policy needs to, to, to do. They have to change the environment. So a sustainable lifestyle, uh, a lifestyle in harmony with nature oh. is the easiest way to go. And, and So not voluntary. Okay, so New York, big cities are voluntary, but policies have to change to make it that way, right? To create cities that are more sustainable so you don't have a car. Also for the companies, no? And, and here perhaps a last point. I really like what you said on following through, no? We had all these nice commitments. We had the Paris Agreement. We also here at World Economic Forum have every year very nice co commitments. What's important is really to follow through and also to also shed the light. Sometimes you're very critical with those who are acting. Say there are, and we need to be critical, no? And see that there's no greenwashing, but we should also put the light on those who are not acting. And I think policy needs to try, and I think, for instance, Biden's suggestion to, that the government only buys with companies who commit to Paris, who commit to science-based targets, I think that's a smart policy. So that policy tries to leverage so only use government money for government cronies who adhere to the environmental mega scam. Got it. Also the action from, from companies and somehow gets all companies to act. No, I think this is a smart way to do politics. Yeah. Take the money away, uh, tax the people, put the money into your own companies like Solyndra and these others who go belly up because they don't work and move the free market out of the equation so that the World Economic Forum can manage everybody's affairs. Now, while this is taking place over there, there are a bunch of police goons who are out, you know, protecting the elite from the peasants who might dare to challenge their authority and put their security at risk. But while they're there, some interesting things are happening, right? These uh, you know, people that, you know, are, are, a lot of people are gonna be busy in Davos. Restaurants are gonna be full. All of the taxis are gonna be shuffling people all over the place. The limousine drivers are gonna be, you know, booked to the max. And so are the hookers. Zero Hedge tells us that this week, global elites who are supposedly tackling the world's problems, like so-called climate change, well, they're also gonna be partying over there, demand for sex workers by business tycoons and world leaders surges during the five-day summit. One escort named Liana told a German newspaper called Build that she dresses in business attire to blend in with a crowd of elites while at the summit. She said that her client is an American who attends the meeting. She charges 700 euros per hour or 2,300 euros for the whole night. Man, it's a nice billable rate. Sheesh. She sheds light on the dark side of Davos, telling Bill that the demand for prostitutes skyrockets during the meeting. An escort service also confirmed that sex workers would be very busy this week. Bosses book, book escorts in the hotel suite for themselves and their employees. <laughs> hey, let's go to Davos. We're gonna save the planet and we're all gonna have a massive orgy together. A manager of an escort service told the newspaper, the manager told the workers that their services would be in high demand for the next couple of days. Somebody posted this on Twitter. They said date in Switzerland during WWF, or I guess WEF, means looking at the gun muzzles of security guards in the hotel corridor at 2 a.m. and then sharing the giveaway chocolates from the restaurant with them and gossiping about their rich. An investigation into this demand skyrocket was first reported by the Times. They found that at least 100 known prostitutes traveled to the summit back in 2020. This year, they invited 2,500 global elites and nearly 30,000 more are expected to attend dinners and wild parties at the ski resorts as they all rule us. Now, while they're out there, you know, wearing their masks and engaging in satanic sex rituals or whatever they do, 
Uh, their police, the little goons out there, are of course securing the perimeter against journalists and anybody who might be investigating, including the folks over at Rebel News who do a great job on all of these. They fly people all over the place. Uh, outstanding work, so make sure you're following them everywhere. But Rebel News was there on the scene at Davos, outside where the World Economic Forum has their annual meet and greet, and they're noticing a pretty heavy police presence. And watch as this police officer approaches these journalists, tries to get in their face with a big fat show of force before recognizing he's over the line. Here's some more serious I'm cops, and that says police, but that's your drab green Camouflage. These are the serious blokes. And this is a new vehicle. This wasn't here last time I was here. This this vehicle here, which has the that looks the, like an anti-riot screen in case people are throwing things at at the vehicle. I think that's what that's for. For absolutely, yeah. but it makes you wonder what, what what intel did they get? Or here's this cop. Now take a look at this cop. Right, he comes walking out of nowhere. These other officers are standing around. This dude is the biggest dude of all of them, right? He's got a big, he's big, tall guy. And watch what happens as he walks into the scene. They're just standing around filming. Nobody's bothering them. The other cops don't even care. Watch this guy. Here's some more serious I'm cops. And that says police, but that's your drab green camouflage. These are the serious blokes. And this is a new vehicle. This wasn't here last time I was here. This, this vehicle here, which has the... That looks the, like an anti-riot screen maybe, in case people are throwing things at at the vehicle. I think that's what that's for. For Absolutely. Yeah. But it makes you wonder what, what, what intel did they get? Or... Why I ask why? Look at him. Yeah, why I ask that? why? Not it's answering. part of the news, Look isn't at him. it? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. But we don't like our faces in the news. Look how close. Okay. okay. So I respect you... that. We'll blur your face. I promise we'll blur your yeah, face. That will it's be... a promise. Huh? Okay. It's a promise. I promise we, we do will. our jobs. We have families at home. We don't need us in the I respect right? that. We'll blow your Thank face. You. Thank you for that. Fair deal. He says he doesn't want his face all over the world. We'll blur his face. He's not a he's not a personal story, but the police is a story. When you've got reports that five thousand police and military five thousand that's news. 5,000 police. That's over from Rebel News. Make sure you support them. They put the web address up here on the screen. Let's get myself out of the way so you can go over there to wefreports.com. Give these guys a follow. They're out there in the cold. They are out there doing some great reporting and some hard work. And they're dealing with these goons over there, right? This is a global problem. Anywhere you look, these, these cops are all over the place like this. Big tall guy. Oh, look, it's Perolini. Oh, that's his name, Perolini. Just so you know. Uh, forgot to blur that out. They didn't blur his face out on that one, but all right, Perolini just showed up there. All right, okay. Uh, that's, you know, that's a Swedish, I guess, police officer, I guess. Uh, anyways, so we'll leave that there, but this is this individual who is uh, out there. They're dealing with these goons all over the place and they are gonna be there for the next couple of days in Switzerland, in public. That's what's happening at the World Economic Forum, of course. We will continue to cover this. There'll be more st stories out there. We'll see what Christopher Ray has to say and others. But thank you for joining us and following along as we are uh, covering this story. I hope you join us as we do. Thank you for liking this video and hitting the subscribe wherever it is you are following us. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friend. Now, uh, thank you for joining us. We covered a lot of ground. I saw some very interesting super chats come in. Let's take a look at what you had to say about this over from our friends on YouTube before we jump into our after party at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Let's see what we have here. Coming in at the start of the show, our first one in the house was from Mrs. Mom says, did I hear that Schwab left Davos? So I don't think so. I think he was there. We saw him. I saw that he left and then I guess maybe he just, you know, had a trip or something. But he is back in town. We saw him speak today. Grow Live is in the in the chat. Thank you Grow Live for the dono. No question on that, but I appreciate you sharing that one with us and supporting the show with that dono. Yeshua's healing and delivery says important question. Who leaked it to CBS? That's a great question. I don't know. Why was it leaked to them? A lot of good questions, 
why did it take so long for it to get leaked out? Why did it have to leak before it became public? Don't know. JT says, I enjoy the work you put in. As to the double standard, Wall Street Journal just put out an article today where the DOJ and the Biden staff decided together they didn't need the DOJ to monitor the hunt for docs. Didn't need the DOJ to monitor the hunt for docs. Which is, I guess that's the same question that Kareem got today. Kareem got the question about whether or not well, actually, they were asking her, why is the White House counsel going down there instead of the DOJ? They said that they didn't need the DOJ to monitor. Why not? Why did they need them to monitor Trump then? And Biden's people aren't even evidently cleared to go look at all these materials. Don't know. Thank you for the support there, JT. Another one came in for Odama Amato. Thank you, Odama. Says Biden is too demented to know what's going on. That's why they just give him the written statements and he just reads from it. Not much to it. Thank you, Odama Amato. I appreciate your being here and the support. Ray K says, we take classified documents and we take them seriously. That's what Kareen said many times over and over. I don't think that that's a good defense. I don't think that that excuses any criminal liability, but they control the Justice Department. We'll see what the special counsel does. Raider Gaines is in the house, says his Delaware home doesn't have a White House log, but was able to have close to one million invested into it for fencing, security, and cams and other things. Yeah, but they don't, I mean, basically they're saying that they don't have the logs because they don't want to turn them over. I'm sure they know who has been at the residence, but the fact that they can't generate them right, provides them a very convenient excuse to not have to provide them. Good to see you, Raider Gaines. Nicholas James is here, says the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Hail Hydra. Maybe you meant the golden rule. The golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. And all those 5,000 corporations have big, big money. Uh, Tommy says, oh no, Rob, Avi from Rebel, Rebel causes trouble. Well, I mean, there are Rebel news. That's why they are out there. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it, it's I think it's appropriate to have freedom of the press. I don't know what the rules are in Switzerland. I, I don't know if that officer had the right to ask them for that, right, or what the laws are over there. But, you know, he he complied. He was generous and nice to them about it. I don't know that he has to do that. He was convenient, you know, nice about it. But they're cops. They're on public streets. The other cops, he was allowed, you know, he, he filmed their faces. And he didn't stop filming. So my guess is the rules are perfectly clear. They identify themselves and that's all perfectly fine. He was just being courteous. Now that guy was not being courteous. That guy got in their face and was being kind of a jerk to them, right? With his presence, his physical presence. And I think that was pretty reprehensible. But, uh, you know, they were able to talk through it like gentlemen and they worked it out. Gent Tiffer is over on Rumble, says they say that some of the classified docs incriminate Obama when he sent Iran billions in cash not approved by Congress. It was a bribe and money laundering scheme. Yeah, is that why his attorneys were out there rummaging through a bunch of stuff? Like, what was the trigger for Joe? Why did, why did suddenly these lawyers start rummaging around all of the documents? What were they looking for? Why did they just start cleaning this stuff up? Don't know but we've got questions about it. Oh my gosh, look what's happening over on Twitter. We have three viewers, which means it's Paul Mino and his two cellular devices. Good to see you, Paul. Let's see who's in the house over here before we scroll down to our Twitter comments. We always like to do just a quick scroll through, uh, a pre-screen for the YouTube audience, just to make sure we don't get any, uh, you know, Twitter's a, Twitter's a wild place. Uh, let's see what we had in here from our good friend, Paul Mino at Sleepy Dog Lee. Four Patriots has your food for the hippies. Yeah, we're learning that our, our uh, community is very hipster. Vegans and healthy food. 25-year uh, shelf life. Look, this very nice young lady. Part of our very diverse community. And get your Four Patriots food. Thank you, Paul. I'm sure I'll, I'll save that and add that to the mind map. Actually, let's go ahead and do that right now before I forget. Got that one ready to go. Vienti Kisses over here says, Cotton Schwab, the stuff we are doing is preparing for the world stuff we wanted, so we better be prepared for getting what we want. 
The stuff we are doing is preparing the world for stuff we wanted, so we better get prepared for what we want. I guess that's a good point there, V. Good point on that one. Here, Komba, uh, uh, Shishna here, says someone would have told him, if, if, someone should have told him that Ernst Stavo Blofield was actually an evil villain and therefore not a good role model to emulate. Is this a real picture of a real dude? Is Dr. Evil based off of a real dude? That's pretty interesting. Here's another one from Paul Mino, watching the watchers. Yeah, it's just far out, dude, is what we got going on here. Paul Mino is sharing this one. It's gotten so bad, even the elites are LARPing. Live action role play. As, I guess this is like an official outfit. I don't know what it is. It's probably culturally inappropriate or insensitive, you know, that I don't know what it is or whatever. But uh, it, it does look like he's a Klingon character in a Star Trek film. This one also came in from Paul Mino. RobertLikesGold.com and tie-dye too. I like gold and tie-dye. Here, Vientica says, there's a reason why I call these large, large organizations nation corporations, because they are. Uh, Coach says, kick me in the jimmy. Carrie is an a-hole. No idea how people really live. I'd like to see them live on $50,000 a year just one year. Dude, their flights, or their flights are $100,000. Okay, to fly there. <laughs> it's uh, It's got to be crazy. Danny McWilliams says, on this, this episode has left me more down than all the others that you've done. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, always. Always. All this stuff is just little tyrant dictator losers. Okay, don't let these people scare you or get you down. They're all idiot losers. Right? This has been tried historically for thousands of years. Okay, the arc of history is very long. Freedom prevails. Freedom is on an upward trajectory. It looks like this, right? It kind of goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But the, the total arc of freedom is up. And look, there may be a bifurcation in this world at some point where the freedom people go this way and everybody else stays plugged into the system with their chips and jabs and whatever. So have, have hope. Things are going to be good. This one came in from Danny McWilliams. This is Asimov's foundation, but with a sad ending. Danny says, I live on hail on that. This guy, Robert, Robert, Roberto, pff, beautiful first name, says, you're my favorite channel on YouTube. Thank you. And look at this friendly puppy. What a nice boy. You're my favorite channel. I'm certain they were looking for documents. CA Human says the first call was to a fixer. Her favorite word is prudent. I think KJP might disappear if she doesn't stop saying how clear she's been. Usually the guilty dog bark barks first. Those are all some good comments over from our friends on Twitter. And we like to check in on Twitter to support Elon and uh, the free speech networks out there. We had this one from Cohen says, Mr. Govea, I come home from work every night to watch your show with my wife. However, my eight-year-old son keeps harassing me and asking me, what is the program this guy is using? Please help so that we can have peace of mind while watching your incredible show. Many thanks, sir. The program, the mind map is called Mind Meister. I get a lot of questions about that. This software is called MindMeister. And I think I have an affiliate link in my link tree. If you want to, I don't know if you get anything. I think I have an affiliate link, but I don't know if you get anything. So I don't really care if you use it or not. But it's um, it's called MindMeister.com. And it's very, very powerful. I love it. You can see I use it for all sorts of stuff. It's very visual, very easy to use. And so shout out to your eight-year-old son. He's interested in making mind maps. Man, it's smart. It took me 35 years to figure out a mind map. Man, he's eight years old. Sharp young man. But that is all over from our friends on Twitter. And of course, we are shouting out <clears throat> our friends over on Rumble. I see Odessia's over there. Little Galaxy's in the house. Army Brat, Eric Scorpio, Orin Hill, Dog Digger, MNL Hayes is there. Says, Rob, that's a James Bond character. That's what I think so, too. Yeah, I think so, too. Those are from my friends on Rumble. We're also going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our after party, which is actually where we're going right now. And so if you'd like to join us for just a quick minute or two, you can click this link, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. That's where we're going right now. We also have, of course, our sponsors at 4 As we wrap up the show, thank you to our sponsors. You can get survival food, survival gear, 
10% off using code Robert if you go over to fourpatriots.com and it's a good idea to be prepared. We also have gold. So if you'd like to consider protecting your retirement with gold or silver, talk to my friends at robertlikesgold.com. They've got all sorts of deals and they can send you some information. Also, our law firm, the r r Law Group. I know most people are not from Arizona. Maybe don't ever come to Arizona, but if you heard, uh, heard or hear of anybody who has been to Arizona, and they are in trouble with the law, that's what our law firm does. We help good people charged with crimes. Online, you can get free case evaluations at rrlawaz.com or give us a call, 480-787-0394. And Vienti, just put the link down in the webs in the chat below. Thank you very much, V, for you. <clears throat> All right, and so that, my friends, is it for us. Big thanks go out to the mods on the, the day. Big shout outs to Vienti, Kiss, K Bean, Playing hooky, just cause. I haven't seen Lean here in a couple days. We miss you, Lean. Playing hooky, Ronnie Cole. We got Zulu I see in the chat. Good to see you, Zulu. Zulu and Geomancy Games as well. But that, my friends, is it for us on the show. We are going to come back tomorrow <clears throat> to do it all again. And I hope to see you right back here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Have a tremendous evening, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.